Question for you. Hands up, who knows that today is the anniversary of the sacking of Rome by Visigoths in the year 410. <laughs> Everybody, that's great. Okay. <laughs> but did you also know that today is the anniversary of the toppling of Smooth oh, oh. <laughs> by <laughs> Now uh, I'm uh, I'm not drawing a comparison between Alaric the First, King of the Barbarians, and Scott Morrison. <laughs> I'm not. For a start, uh, Alaric had a moustache. <laughs> but it is interesting to think about what might have happened if Peter Dutton had won the leadership spill against Malcolm Turnbull instead of Scott back in 2018. To remind us of what happened at the time, here's Concretia Doyley paraphrasing Doc Brown from Back to the Future 2. Thanks, Sean. In 2018, Australia's time continuum was disrupted, creating a new temporal event sequence resulting in an alternate reality. Imagine that this line represents time. There's the past, 2018, the then future and the present. At this point in time, as a result of the Liberal Party leadership spill, the timeline skewed into this tangent, creating an alternate four-year <laughs> LNP term. <laughs> One in which Scott Morrison is Prime Minister instead of Malcolm Turnbull. The government is corrupt and Peter Dutton <laughs> had to wait until 2022 to become leader of the Liberal Party. Sure. Great Scott! <laughs> Thank you very much, Concretia. Now, I don't want to spend another week bagging the former PM, but if you'll allow me, I do have a few words to say about the former Treasurer, Home Affairs, Industry, Science, Resources, Health and Finance Ministers. As he has uh, been at great pains to tell us, our inability to understand what he did is... ..the result of um, not having walked in my shoes. Which I assume are these Photoshop ones. <laughs> But in fairness to Scott, he has tried to use even more confusing metaphors to account for our puzzlement. You're standing on the shore after the fact. I was steering the ship in the middle of the tempest. <laughs> so, uh, so some further reading on this subject, this book based on extensive interviews with Scott... ..that were conducted at the time in the middle of the tempest. So, it's, you know, it's a testament to Scott that he could spare the time and that those conducting interviews were even able to hear Scott from the shore, especially <laughs> over all that wind and everything. <laughs> or perhaps the uh, interviews were conducted using semaphore. <laughs> Either way, very impressive. Now, as to how Scott, being a minister at the same time, someone else was also that minister could work, he offered, he offered this analogy, saying it's... Like you have on a nuclear submarine, actually, when the nuclear weapons are deployed, you have two keys as to how these things are done. Now, of course, it is helpful if the other guy with the key knows that it's a two-key arrangement. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to be sitting there wondering why the nuclear missiles don't launch when he turns the ignition on. And the, and the other thing is, uh, the keys have to be turned simultaneously and in the same direction, not, as Keith Pitt found, in the opposite direction. <laughs> He's you know, sitting there turning the key thinking he's launching a review into the PEP 11 gas drilling permit. Well, Scott turns his key aborting it. <laughs> so, so who was in charge of resources? Liberal PM Scott or Nationals MP Keith? Well, fortunately for us, the former Nationals leader in charge at the time has cleared up any confusion. <laughs> Just to be clear on this, you felt uh, you would lose the extra ministry and staff and so on uh, if no, you pushed back on Scott was, Morrison was, taking this portfolio. Yeah. <laughs> David, I, would, I didn't feel... I was absolutely certain that would have happened. He said that, did he? He negotiated the said portfolio. That. There. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. David, so why were you certain? He said, cheers. Who is now, the look, responsible I, I minister? My, I, Who was the responsible minister? The Who was the responsible minister for resources? Well, it would have, ultimately, it really still remained with Keith. It was the Pep 11 decision, David. But who was the responsible minister on that decision? Keith, I just gave you the answer, mate. I don't, I don't listen to it the first time I said. Well, I'm still confused. Was it Scott Morrison or Keith? Well, it's Pitt? not. There, there's nothing confused. There's nothing confusing about it, David. Listen to me. Keith Pitt was the minister. 
And I'm telling you, look, I, and there's no trick, you know, hokery pickery, you know, trick to this. I'm giving you a straight answer. Keith Pitt, oh, well, on everything in resources, was responsible. There was a conjecture on one issue, PEP 11, right? It's as clear as that. <laughs> And it's not just Scott and Barnaby we've heard from this week about all this. Every journalist who ever lived, any half-wit with a social media account or a TV show has an opinion. So many points of view, in fact, that even Andrew Bolt struggled to get a word in. Penises. <laughs> but what did the people at the coalface think? Not the ministers who were being replicated out of the former PM's lust for power, but the advisers and staff for these secret ministries. Dolly Norman, you were Scott Morrison's chief of staff in his health ministry. Uh -huh. uh, his media officer for the finance ministry. Yes. Advisor to him as resources minister. Yep. Picked up his sandwiches for him in social services. Correct. And a job shared with an unpaid intern in his treasury and home affairs portfolios. Uh -huh. How did you come to be appointed? Um, I have no idea, Sean. <laughs> he did it secretly. All right. So you had no idea you had these jobs either? Um, I didn't know nothing. <laughs> one minute, I was working in the private sector, one-on-one, -on -one teaching gender studies to Catherine Deeves. <laughs> Next minute, I'm sucked into a vortex and spewed out into a suite of offices in old Parliament House. All right, now what, tell me, what was it like working for Scott? Um, much easier than you'd think. He's a really beautiful spirit. <laughs> Often would you see him? Um, not at all. Oh, he never came in. <laughs> uh, occasionally he'd leave a post-it note on a chair with a list of ingredients for a curry he had planned. And you were expected to go and, and, uh, and buy them for him? I was expected to make it for him. <laughs> and eat it. <laughs> he was very busy, as he'll tell you at every opportunity. Would you, would you work for him again? I probably am. <laughs> Yes, the Governor General. All right. Well, speaking of the Governor General, David Hurley said he had no reason to think the appointments were not being communicated. Constitutional law expert Professor Luke Beck called this, and please excuse the esoteric prose typical of these academics, bullshit. <laughs> Which begs the question, would a bullshitting Governor General be a constitutional crisis? Well, the Constitution doesn't mention bullshitting anywhere. The Founding Fathers uh, couldn't have known back then that bullshitting would become an integral part of the fabric of political life. <laughs> and that's why I'm proposing that when we have the referendum on an Indigenous voice to Parliament, we put a second question on the ballot which reads, also, do you support an alteration to the Constitution to address instances of bullshitting by officers <laughs> of the Crown? <laughs> Melbourne Hecht, you are the keeper of the biro the Governor-General uses to sign his proclamations. <laughs> Well, His Excellency is not one to stand on ceremony, Sean. Such protocols were relaxed during the reign of his most imperial Morrison Treginter. <laughs> Since then, the vice regal signature is kept as a JPEG on the Governor General's computer desktop. <laughs> Picked and dragged onto has been emailed to him for his assent. Sometimes, if he's in the toilet, I do it for him. <laughs> David Hurley has said that he had no reason to think Scott Morrison's cabinet roles would stay secret. What about in the months that followed where they remained secret? Didn't that make him uh, change his mind? <laughs> Sean, you've got to understand that since Sir John Kerr and the dismissal of Gough Whitlam, Governors General have been petrified to think or do anything other than turn on Anzac Day or hand out a few scrolls at a tea party now and then. Whatever the PM of the day tells him to do, he does, no questions asked. Well, it's, if Scott Morrison had told him to run naked down Macquarie Street, would he have? I'd have to check his official diary. <laughs> didn't he think something was up when he didn't see these appointments gazetted? It's not the Governor-General's job to address his mind or indeed engage in any way when the PM asks him to do something. He's there to do it. Yeah, well, he's not <laughs> some reflex that twitches when you hit it with a small hammer. He's supposed, to, he's supposed to represent the Crown. And Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth is 96 years old and slowing down. The Governor-General is just doing his best to emulate her decline in faculties. <laughs> What is the point of proclaiming something if no-one hears it? Sean, if a tree falls in the forest, it's still lying on the ground the next day, regardless of whether Scott Morrison posts a picture of it on Instagram. <laughs> anyway, these were unprecedented and perilous COVID times, and Scott never exercised his secret powers anywhere except for that one time. <laughs> so what's the big deal? It's a good question. Why go to all the trouble of acquiring these powers and never actually use them? Psychologist Dr Desiree Munch. Why would Scott Morrison want these secret powers if, as he says, the fact his ministers did not know of his actions was proof that he did not exercise the powers he gave himself? 
Yes. It's a complex question, Sean. <laughs> there are many deep-rooted psychological reasons why a man would choose to self-appoint to so many ministries and then not enjoy all the fruits of his accumulated power. <laughs> As I told Ellen Fanning when she asked me to appear on the drum to answer this very question, it would make for a very long and, I'm afraid, dull analysis that would invariably leave you as bored and none the wiser. I assume, <laughs> I assume they booked you anyway? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Well, in a, in a nutshell, though. Well, it's similar to a man wearing women's underwear under his clothing. He doesn't need to display it publicly for all the world to see, but he feels empowered as he goes about his day-to-day -day business with his illicit secret. Of course, of course, it, it needn't be a secret. These days, we don't judge a person because they choose to swear themselves into multiple ministries. Oh, yes. We have progressed as a society to the point where we would barely raise an eyebrow over such a fascist-like power grab. But there might be something that happened during his fall years to make him ashamed of his megalomaniacal tendencies. Perhaps his parents walked in on him in his bedroom while he was acquiring power as a boy. <laughs> yeah, it's, the, uh, it's the secrecy that's the problem, isn't it? Not the fact of the multiple ministries. It would be unethical for me to come to any diagnosis based on Scott Morrison's psychopathography. So let's just say that whatever the reason, he got his jollies from it. <laughs> And it's not just normal, everyday people who are affronted by Morrison's assault on the Westminster system. Some in the Liberal Party have been quick to condemn the former leader. Malcolm Turnbull, John Howard, John Hewson, <laughs> Tony Abbott, <laughs> even Robert Menzies could be heard spinning in his grave. <laughs> Listen very carefully. There he goes, like a turbine. <laughs> But what does the most recent leader of the Liberal Party think? I think most people, frankly, Mark, want to move on and start dealing with issues that are more important, and I hope that we can get back to things that matter now. Well, let's do just that. E4 to the Shadow Prime Minister, <laughs> Brian Pegmatite. What's Peter's take on the government's electric vehicle strategy? Um, well... Uh, yeah, the federal I... ICAC? Uh, um, the <laughs> tax breaks to lower middle income families? Well, it's, um... It... Uh, why Peter isn't attending the government's job summit while David Littleproud is? Yeah, uh, I think he's washing his hair that night. <laughs> Okay, so, so what about uh, this multiple ministries thing? Peter's position on that is clear, Sean, that we should move on from it, except in so far that we can use it to accuse the current Prime Minister of not letting it go and trying to get as much political mileage out of it as he can. Mm. And after that? I imagine we'll find something else we can accuse him of getting hysterical about. <laughs> What's important here is that Peter has the last word. His former Home Affairs co-minister, Karen Andrews, says Peter Dutton has drawn a line in the sand. And where is that exactly? Just around where we've buried our heads in it. <laughs> As to what the current PM thinks, listen to this and tell me if you think it's a hysterical overreaction. Uh, well, the first rule of Power Grab Club is don't talk about Power Grab Club. <laughs> and Scott Morrison broke that rule today. Mm. In fact, if you can tell me what it means at all, I'd be grateful. <laughs> it's clearly a pop cultural reference. What do you think, pop cultural enthusiast Crane Girdle? <laughs> it's a reference to Fight Club, Sean. Yeah, yeah, we know that. What does it, <laughs> what does it mean, though? How, how was what Scott Morrison did like the film Fight Club? Oh, I see. Oh, well, well, I guess uh, Scott Morrison is like Edward Norton, who, discontented with his white-collar job, forms Fight Club slash Power Grab Club, <laughs> where he fights slash becomes other people slash ministers. In the way that Edward Norton is actually Brad Pitt, Scott Morrison is Keith Pitt. <laughs> And also Greg Hunt, Matthias Kuhlman, Karen <laughs> Andrews and Josh Freinberg. Well, that, uh, hang on, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't really work, though, does it? Because Brad Pitt isn't real, whereas Keith Pitt, regrettably, is. <laughs> as, as are the others. True. OK, and Albo's point seems to be not so much the conflict of disassociated personalities as the fact that Scott broke the first rule of fight slash power grab club, <laughs> that is, not keeping it secret. So does that mean that uh, Albo's in the club, too? Is that why he's cross? Is Albo the Brad Pitt character? Maybe Albo was just making a joke. He likes making jokes. He told us he was a bulldozer. Turns out he was the world, world's first stealth bulldozer. It's worthy of Bill Short in that one. <laughs> ScoMo, too, he enjoys a laugh. 
off as, as when he posted a picture of comedy group Sushi Mango with, with his own head photoshopped on one of them and, 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 and said, as Aussies, we can always have a bit of a chuckle at ourselves. <laughs> he, he's making light of the whole constitutional impropriety of the thing. <laughs> doesn't take what he's done seriously. <laughs> and, and, and as he says, I'm loving these posts. Yeah. Mind you, him loving other people's posts is exactly what got him into this trouble in the first place. <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much, Craig. Yeah. 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 What was that? Yeah. I said, me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, Crane Girl, we're looking at, looking at life through the prism of pop <laughs> culture. <laughs> did, you, did you enjoy that back to the... <laughs> did you enjoy that Back to the Future 2 reference it, earlier? It left me wanting more. <laughs> <laughs> The echidna eats ants and has quills to protect it from predators. In truth, the predators don't want to come near it anyway because of its ant breath. The quills have evolved as an excuse for the echidna to use when other animals ask why it's never attacked by other wildlife. They don't like me because of my halitosis is too much for the echidna to admit. That's Sean McAuliffe's Echidnas in Denial. How nature enables Australia's egg-laying social pariah. Coming soon. Now, we haven't seen subpar editor of the Daily Telegraph, Chris Lorax, for a while, so we've uh, got a lot of headlines to get through, haven't we, Chris? Oh, yeah. <laughs> OK, here we go. First one up there. Uh, drug runners are drone and dusted. Uh, yeah, so, so, you know, done and dusted. Yeah. So we... My problem here is not with dusted. That, that's, that's obviously brilliant. <laughs> but drone. Now, while drone has a physical resemblance to done, it has no audible similarity. <laughs> drone doesn't sound like done. Well, don't say it then, just read it. <laughs> Must I? Here we go, here's the next one. End this knife or death saga. Uh, yeah, so, so instead of life or death, because it was about stabbings, mm -hmm. uh, I changed life to knife. Mm -hmm. See? <laughs> they have an audible resemblance. <laughs> Yes, but knife and death aren't really the uh, alternatives that life and death are, though, are they? The knife or death is just death. <laughs> Does that matter? Well, as <laughs> rational, sentient beings, it's in our nature to try and make sense of things, isn't it? <laughs> From our place in the universe to whatever this is. <laughs> Sherry Markson snorted out coffee through her nose when she read that. <laughs> um, just down here, bottom right-hand corner, Algae Geddon. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so Armageddon, but it's about algae, so we've got. Yeah, again, Armor Algae. Not very close, are they? <laughs> they start with the same letter. <laughs> so do paper and psychiatrist. <laughs> It's not all about puns, Sean. We do other things as well. Mm, I know, I've seen the Harvey Norman ads. Look at this one. <laughs> you go, man, 61, back from the dead. Hard hitting, relatable, accurate. Accurate, really? I mean, it says the man wasn't actually dead, he was just missing. Yeah, that's why we put quotation marks around dead. <laughs> so, quotation marks in the Daily Telly, rather than being around words someone actually said, are used to indicate what's been quoted was, in fact, never said by anybody. Yeah. So, the opposite of what quotation marks are meant to convey. It's just a bit of fun. <laughs> Is fun in quotation marks? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, to electricity prices now, and if they're any higher, they'd risk colliding with the overhead power lines, causing the kind of grid infrastructure damage that's contributing to themselves. <laughs> Chief Ponder of the IPA, Fluffer Cologne. Hang on, that's me. <laughs> Just pay the failage fee out of petty cash and send John Roskam the account. What's, uh, what's to be done, do you think? The solution is obvious, Sean. Nationalise the energy grid and the power generators. All right, so national... Like, like the ABC? Perfect comparison. Give the electricity companies a certain amount of funding each year and tell them to make enough electricity for everyone. All right, and if, it, and if, it's, if it's not enough money, they can just make worse quality electricity. Bingo. <laughs> Of course, if they're like the ABC, we'd want to ensure they provide both right-wing and left-wing electricity. <laughs> right-wing electricity being...? Coal, gas, stuff that works reliably but generally makes the world worse. You know, for balance. Right. Nuclear? <sighs> nuclear fission is right-wing but not nuclear fusion, obviously. Yeah, why, why not nuclear fusion? Fusion is left-wing because it's a nice idea but it doesn't work in practice. 
<laughs> well, car carbon capture and storage is a nice idea that doesn't work in practice. Is that left wing? No, that's right wing because it's just some bullshit. You tell people to let you keep doing whatever you want. <laughs> but but if, it, if it did ever work... What... I'll call you back. Then it would become left wing because it would be a world saving virtue signal that also drives up costs and makes traditional industries uncompetitive. Well, thank you very much, Fluffer Cologne. <laughs> <laughs> but what do we do in the interim? Well, thank God for the Australian energy market regulator, George and Martha. Join us now from Emo, guys. Uh, what is the what is the Australian energy market regulator exactly, and what does it do? Emo is a kind of partnership between the state and federal governments and energy suppliers. Just a minute, And Martha. what we do is regulate the market. A bit like the RBA regulates our money by not doing anything most of the time. Wait a minute, Martha. By not doing anything most of the time. But when there's a problem... Stop it, Martha. ..we run in and interfere with it. Well, well, the Reserve Bank doesn't suspend the banking industry and take it over when there's a problem, though, does it? No, but, of course, the Reserve Bank isn't comprised of both the government and business. And the Reserve Bank's not a very good analogy, is it? Well, perhaps it's more helpful to imagine Emo is more of a hen house and us as foxes. I wouldn't go on like this if I were you. Oh, you don't think that's such a helpful analogy either, do you, darling? <laughs> How about Dracula and the blood bank? That's more like your credit rating agencies like Moody's. Remora, shark, pilot fish, whale. If you start in on this business, Martha, I'm warning Getting you. Getting angry, baby, huh? How about Venom? There will be carnage. Stop it, Martha. Let's just say it's a partnership between the private sector and the public sector. We each have an equal say in what we do. Well, 60-40. Yes, the government has more of a say, but obviously it's in their interest to keep the energy suppliers happy and let us have our own way as much as possible. Like the private schools and our education system. Christ! Oh. Some, some of their suppliers were, uh, were accused of gaming the system during the crisis by uh, holding back supplies of energy and <laughs> making the price per unit even more expensive. Do these supplies even deserve a place at the table? It's no different from the diamond market or the ivory trade. If you don't allow the cartel behaviour to continue unchecked most of the time, your car gets riddled with bullets and your family gets kidnapped. Isn't that right, Martha? Of course, electricity and gas aren't high-end luxury goods, are they? Well, they are the prices he's charging. <laughs> shouldn't, shouldn't the regulator be exclusively a government body, though, independent of the industry, like ASIC or uh, the ACCC? Well, you need some funding to run the place effectively. We may be slow to act and rife with conflict, but at least we can step in at the last moment and stop the market from collapsing in on itself as a result of its own greed. I agree 100%. 40%. I swear to God, Martha! At the end of the day, this is just about people making sure they have access to energy. Exactly. Without them, we'd have no customers at all. <laughs> well, thank you very much, George and Martha. Well, later on in the program, residents concerned about imported nuclear waste to be stored at Lucas Heights. We say residents shouldn't be stored anywhere and should be allowed to run freely in their suburb, regardless of their views. Plus, Tosh Greenslade puts faces to two of the voices from the Media Watch team. So what's it like to verbalise every week the stories and headlines that we can already read for ourselves on the screen? It's fun and easy. A complete no-brainer. I have the best job in the world. The verbatim reading leaves no room for error and a neutral tone must be adopted at all times. <laughs> Look forward to that. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. Oh, goodness me. Hello, hello, yes. Hello, what gas? Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, <laughs> I've just been advised that the ABC Complaints Ombudsman is on his way to make sure the show is not doing anything that would offend anyone, uh, any of the right-wing nutjobs who watch or the lefty snowflakes <laughs> who might be watching the show tonight. Um, oh, oh, here he comes. Everybody, everybody, act natural. <laughs> Well, everything seems to be in order. <laughs> In the summer, as the earth warms, these dogs will attempt to deliver boxes of fresh stone fruits like nectarines, oblivious to the fact that they spilled out some time ago. Sean McAuliffe's Dickhead Animals, Saturday, 7.38.
<laughs> Welcome back. Well, we live in secular times and worship money, but need that necessarily <laughs> rule out belief in God and an afterlife? Pearl Trumpet has more. Former Father Beamish is a defrocked priest working here in this deconsecrated church, which I can't name because it's really hard to pronounce. But for reasons he'd rather not talk about, former Father Beamish has decided to branch out on his own with a new religion he hopes will prove just as popular as the old ones. Its central tenet is still that rewards will come to the deserving after death. The difference is, though, that it is a completely digital religion with no fees and charges, one that takes place entirely in in the cyber world. It's called Everlastium. Of the Lord! Well, like traditional belief systems in things like God, or fairies, or cryptocurrency, <laughs> Everlastium requires faith of those who trade in it. A collective delusion that it has value. Otherwise, it simply ceases to be of any worth. Oh, you... No, I'm good. Well, each person of faith, or believer, forms a segment in the blockchain in which the flame of the Holy Spirit burns, <laughs> praying for each other's souls and also for their own deliverance after death, at which time these memes of a stoat riding a tricycle can be converted at an exchange for eternal life sitting at the right hand of the Holy Father. Critics, though, say it's a Ponzi scheme. This is an unregulated market taking advantage of the ignorant and the gullible. I mean, who's to say what property prices will be in the Kingdom of Heaven at an indeterminate time in the future? Particularly up near the Paris end of the Holy Father's right hand. <laughs> and then what happens when you're dead and you go to redeem the tokens and then suddenly slap with a capital gains tax? <laughs> All right! Listen to these bedwetters banging on about the guarantee that their faith in God will get them what they want after they've carked it. I'm talking to Tosh's Davy Plum character. I mean, when do you get that on any investment? Bonds, shares, stocks, futures, derivatives, CDOs, non-fungible tokens, the job lot at a white slave auction, the market fluctuates. If the bubble bursts and you get wiped out, so fucking what, you're dead anyway. You want a sure thing? Put your faith in the never-ending cycle of misery that is our own meaningless existence. You can't lose if you bet on the failure of others. Frankly, though, I think that's cynical, and I regret making it a company slogan. <laughs> There are those, too, who are attracted to the prospect of a better life after this one and are prepared to plan for it. When you're young, you don't even think about eternity. It seems too far away to worry about it, so you've written your youth away on sex with strangers and illicit Class A drugs without a thought for tomorrow. <laughs> it's only when you get old and stupid you realise you've completely wasted your life and you need something to believe in beyond this mortal realm. In fact, so desperate are you that you're willing to believe in anything that'll give some peace of mind in your few remaining years, no matter how illogical or patently ridiculous. Go on. That's why Norval and I have allowed ourselves to be exploited by charlatans. Mm. It beats, you know, believing in reality or, or putting our faith in ourselves. What's going on, guys? At the moment, former Father Beamish's stoat on a tricycle memes are selling for $1,600 each as people attempt to buy their way into a comfortable afterlife. As former Father Beamish both produces the NFTs and charges a commission for converting them to cash, he might be said to have made his kingdom here on Earth. But he's not in it for the money. Rather like most of us, he's in it for the stuff it buys. Pearl Trumpet, mad ass. Mm. Well, not coming up because aftertaste is on in a minute. New budget airline Bonza shows off business class. <laughs> and Prime Minister no longer keen on wind power. <laughs> and finally, one thing that's always puzzled me about the Bunnings ads with their staff. You can have a small project in mind. When you come into the store with our lowest prices, you can actually start a project that's actually bigger than what you thought and actually get it finished. Is who it is they're talking to. <laughs> Who's interviewing all these Bunnings team members? I'm curious about that, and I've thought about this a lot over the years, is why are you so adamant there's a particular measurable advantage to coming here as opposed to, say, a local independent hardware emporium? We've got the widest range and at the lowest prices. He's still got it. Goodbye. <laughs> Giant baby.